are live. We out here. We are here. And for okay. those who are joining us, who uh, are Discord members, our patrons, they saw the title of this live stream, which they get to watch. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you noticed it. Did you see what I nope, entitled let me look this at live? It. I'm on the live stream. I don't even know what it's called. Let me, okay. let me find out. <clears throat> it's rolling up. Uh huh. It goes wee. That's right. So moments before we began doing this, I completed Shoyle's prototype number two. And um, the SH1Z Mark II. Oh uh, no! <laughs> and as oh, hold on. As, as we don't have a better way to do this as of yet, uh -huh. I'm just going to hold my phone up to yeah, yeah. the mic this is, and play this, is this audio. YouTube demo quality. Yeah. Oh, well. I <laughs> Here we go. Fuzz. You don't need a guitar signal because... <laughs> and then, as we adjust our bias... Dude, that's pretty sick. Just wait. <laughs> it's totally usable. You know? As fuzzes go, it's pretty transparent. Well, what's funny, so for the for those just joining this process, where's it at? It's right here. Uh, I started making the shoils fuzz, which will not be called the sh the shiz. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the last prototype, it did that, and I thought, oh, it's the order switching. It has to be it. Right. So I ditched all that and just made it like fix which one was before the the octave and the fuzz, and started playing the, my, my little looper, testing it and turning the gain up like, hey, this one sounds good. And then beyond 12 o'clock, that happened. So You know, I bet, I bet that if we, if we infiltrated the gear page, so if we took you and I and our patrons and we like made, you know, spam accounts and we started talking <laughs> about it, I bet if we used enough buzzwords and, uh, and enough people talking about it, we could get the, the gear page people to buy into that prototype. You know, there, there may be a way... Cause I don't, it could be any number of things, <laughs> uh, because like what I'm doing is taking a germanium style circuit and making it silicon and a lot of funny things can happen with the with, uh, gain and then stuff. And, um, yeah, it just freaks out. So I, <laughs> I don't know, but before, uh, the, the old circuit board, all the components were facing like the face of the pedal so you couldn't mm -hmm. see him. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't have it built and put it on my oscilloscope right easily so now they're facing so i'll be able to i'll be able to touch them and people will like outward. that if they can open up the back of the pedal and like see the the transistors and i don't know i mean it's kind of cool when they're like nothing you know like btronics there's nothing there you just i don't know i like seeing the parts well okay let us know in the right. chat do you like seeing the parts or do you like not seeing the the stuff i like seeing the parts personally like them parts i like the parts it's like because you want to know what you're paying for Otherwise, it could just be like some some weird little microchip in there. Yep. You know. Um, but sorry, I kind of blasted into the the intro here. But <laughs> how's no. your, how's your week going? Oh man, I've had a, an eventful week. Okay, so I some people may be familiar with the uh, the Instagram creator Blank Forms. Uh, he's a uh, synthesis and tape looper and uh, his, his Instagram handle is blank for one word dot ms so for years up until last week I thought it was blank for ms but uh, it's blank forms he's an artist ah. and uh, last week he, he put out a blast saying like hey I'm doing a uh, basically an online master class on how to like do four track cassette tape looping and all that kind of stuff and so I signed up for it I got the last slot and I have been learning the uh, wonderful world of tape loops, taking cassettes and uh, making little loops out of them and doing all kinds of fun stuff. And I have, it's been a long time since I've been this fired up about something, like learning something new. Um, I, I'm just 
geeking out on. I'm having so much fun patching it. I've got a Tascam Porta Studio 424 Mark II that I bought a few years ago. And I'm glad I bought it a few years ago because they are crazy expensive now. I'm not getting any cheaper. Weird. And uh, I'm using a bunch of pedals and just having a jolly mint up here making making sounds. Um, are, are you cutting the tape? Yeah. Like so literally, oh. like, I've got, I bought a bunch of tapes back here and I'm opening the cassettes and pulling the tape out and like cutting a, a length of it. And then I'm taking sticky tape, like scotch tape, and I'm taping a loop together and then you stick it back in the cassette you screw the cassette back together and then it just plays on a loop and then mm-hmm. you have the, all your four tracks so you can track different things onto the four tracks and mix them and, and treat it like a live instrument and huh. it's lo-fi and funky and weird and it's awesome i'm having a good old time doing it that's neat i uh i i think like like thinking about you making your own like tape loop i i just envision um pink floyd in the studio when they made the money loop yep and they had it like wrapped around a mic stand and stuff. people do that yeah like there you can you can cut the top off of the tape and so like there's only half of the cassette open and then you can oh, take yeah. a long piece of tape and run it out of the actual cassette and loop it around stuff to hold tension on it and get 15 20 second tape loops going uh-huh. i haven't gotten that far yet i've only made this one's about like four seconds but man yeah. you, you know what that makes me think of i wonder are you familiar with thingiverse uh vaguely so that's a 3d print website where they like people oh. who create things can upload their own like print files and you can print it for free right it's like i wonder if somebody's made like their own like like cassette loop because that seems like an easy thing to print just like some Dude. you know stuff where you could put different distances and Okay, okay. Shout out to the community here. Uh, someone who has a 3D printer, could you... I do. Okay, could you <laughs> make me a cassette where essentially... Let me... Uh, well, let me, let, me, let me do this real quick. So, here's... Let me show you. Basically, what I want is... Let's take these screws out. Uh, oh, shit, not this one. This is my good tape loop. I don't want to mess with... <laughs> Uh, stand by and then i have one other thing to show you and then we can get into the episode but what oh my god i can't i can't go to thingiverse because literally you can type in one thing and they'll show you all sorts of stuff and it's so distracting and it's so cool so zach either you can do this or someone who's watching or listening can do this who has a 3d printer Uh uh-huh take a cassette all right and split it in half split it in twain all right and then Basically, it needs to be cut like right here. So this yeah. upper part's going away, and it, it ideally would just be like that bottom part of the of the cassette. Why are you not focusing, camera? Jesus, Clear. there we go. Yeah. So um, yeah, someone take that on. Get back to me. Let me know how. Oh, it you just out. print it for you could like change like the 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 tape head thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can change. Basically, you can have the the longer length of tape coming yeah. out of it. You know doing that old that old thing so um and then yeah the other thing that happened this week is i bought this shitty old guitar but nobody cares about that Uh, we don't don't need to talk about that it's horrible yeah it's old and weird and red and it's got scratches on it nobody wants to know about that well um fun Mm -hmm. (laughs) that sounds really fun uh i have been living in uh back order shipping hell because we we just today DHL has held my circuit board hostage or something apparently because they finally got delivered after being in the country for many days which for us is is a lot I've had to send the guys home yeah because we're like standing around with a thumbs up our ass it's like what do we do because <laughs> we don't we don't have a lot of our enclosures and the ones we do we don't have circuit boards for um, but when is this going to come out. Uh, wait, am I a keeper of the record here? No, now? no, I'm just, I'm just thinking, cause I have something I want to show, Okay, but I don't want to, uh, spoil it for myself. Is that a thing? So yeah, this should be fine. So I have been working on releasing or revamping all the, the product lines. So everyone is familiar with the Oracle. Well, yep. not everyone that, that's presumptuous of me, but the Oracle uh, came out last year, 
and uh, kind of reassessed how, like how I thought of the brand, uh, or reset how I thought of the brand. Reassess is not the right word, but I started working on the new art. And I don't even think I, I might have sent you a picture oh of these. Oh my god, I'm sorry. Holy shit, my dog just scared the shit out of me. They were on a walk and she just got back and came up and like boot my arm. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. That's so fine. Can, continue. That legitimately scared the shit out of me. <laughs> I thought you were going to say like she farted in the room no, or like took no. a dump. Uh, so I want to share some of the art with you guys. So here's the chupacabra. Oh, it looks so good. Uh, so drew a little cactus on there. I drew that. I was proud of that. Um, uh, here is the Argo. Beautiful. And the Argonaut is very similar to this, uh, just smaller. Golden Fleece is in the room. Don't have that on my, like on me. The Mjolnir, I don't want to show yet cause it's, uh, I got a proto, but we're going to tweak it and then it'll be I'm, like tightening the screws. But all this should be like in my possession by early next week. Beautiful. And, uh, it's very exciting cause I've, we like dealers have been waiting and I'm like, just give me like one more week and we'll be able to get all this stuff to you. So the guys have just been working their asses off building boards and I've been trying to design other things and, and I'm working on some new stuff that's really yeah. exciting. So, I love the new look. The new Chupacabra looks so good. Thank you. Um, so good. But yeah, well. Shall we dip a rig? Let's let's get to dipping. So I have it right here. Add to stream. Blap. Whoa, Ooh. man, it's a, it's a big picture. Hey, he's got, he's got a, a weird shitty old guitar like the shitty old guitar I bought. <laughs> he's, he's got, got two, two of them. them. Wow. So here we go. So this is Mark Huber's rig. Um, and let's see, he plays in a hard rock band. He says, think Seattle grunge vocals meets ACDC with some Zeppelin thrown in there. Uh, they're called Hellbot. Yeah, they <laughs> which are. Which is a great name. <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, he's a member of my uh, inner circle as well. Good guy. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, so have you seen this? No, this is okay. rad. Yeah. So he's got um, two SGs, a 68 SG standard, which is, I think Angus, like his his one from back in the day was a 69 maybe. It might have been a 68. I can't remember. Yep. Um, awesome. And then a 2005 SG Supreme. Uh, and he says he has a part cast, parts caster for single coils. But the pedal board, there's a lot going on here. Um, yeah. And... Uh, apologies for those that can't see it super detailed, but uh, we've got a Rocktron Hush, Game Changer Plasma, JHS Little Black Buffer, the Jackson Audio Bloom, Dunlop Wah, Boss ES8 Looper, uh, Mr. Black Thunderclaw, Greer Southland, Solo Dallas Schaefer Replica, which uh, with SGs and, and this mm -hmm. amp is like a yeah. given. Yeah. Wampler Faux Spring Reverb, uh, into a Walrus Audio Monument, Phase 90, Walrus Julia, Pog, uh, way huge Atreides. Uh, oh my gosh, there's like a volume loop thing, a timeline, a big sky, and this his amp is a Friedman, uh, a JJ100 modded by Dave Friedman to run three channels with the JBE voice switch as well on channel three, which you can use as a clean, dirty rhythm or lead boost. Holy moly! Um, yeah, two Marshall cabs loaded with greenbacks. Usually plays a half, half stack. Hell yeah. So, so look at that. This is a rock and roll rig right here. Dude. Uh, also shout out to the uh, wonderful acoustic treatment, that bass trap in the back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, dude, how, he's, in the, he's in the chat here. How did you do that? Is that... That looks like it's cut on a water jet or something. It's like a sheet of birch plywood or something. I've seen that companies the, that make those, and it's oh, pretty okay. cool. Yeah. yeah, it's like the EVH, you know. Yeah, it looks like yeah Eddie's striped guitar. Nice. Okay, so the guitars, I uh, as a, as a, okay. Let me a little briefly. By the time this comes out, people will have seen the video and and everything about it. But my uh, I just bought today, the day we're filming this, as of like three hours ago, Oops. I became the uh, the proud owner of a 1965 SG Junior that is in absolutely just perfect condition. Um, uh, Five point eight pounds. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's That's light. insane. No neck dive. And it just, it's super loud. Whoa, that's crazy. Yeah, it's, this is a ripper. Um, so I've been looking for an SG for a while and, uh, this one just came into my lap. 
So uh, it awesome. came into my life. Sorry, that sounded weird. I don't know why I just said that. But <laughs> it came into your lap? <laughs> I meant to say <laughs> either came into my life or fell into my lap. And now that might be the most embarrassing thing I've said on the internet. Anyways. <laughs> no way. <laughs> have I said something dumber than that on the internet? <laughs> no, I don't know. But I'm sure. I'm sure the I chat mean. will let me know. Anyways, yeah. So he's saying in the chat, this is a... Uh, Angus's was a 70, but his favorite is oh. the 68. I don't know much about the SG Supreme. I guess that's a more modern take on the... Uh... Yeah, they were like a flamey top thing. Uh, pretty... Um, like a loud looking guitar. Um, limited thing that they did. I'm trying to find some pictures of it. Um, yeah, they... I've not seen one... Uh, usually they're like a carve top thing. Right. Right. It's kind of hard uh, to see in this picture, like yeah. any, any details on it, like what the top looks like or anything like that. But, um, let's, let's move on to the pedal board. This is, this is cool. Um, I'm assuming it's a flat board the way he's got it set in the picture. It's like angled towards the camera. So I can't tell if it's a flat board or if it's an angled board, but it's uh it's not a clean build. We'll put it that way, but I think that's okay. It's pretty rock and roll because, and it's okay because he's got the ES eight switcher. Um, right. If the switcher wasn't there, this setup would be an absolute, it would be borderline unusable. Like you wouldn't be able to tap dance around this board with, with all the stuff. Um, I do like that he's got the big sky and the timeline on the bottom right of the board so you can get to tap tempos. You can switch presets easily if you're into that kind of thing. That's strategic, strategically placed. Mm-hmm. Um, man, yeah, lots of lots of things to break down here on this board. It's kind of like drinking from a fire hose looking at this thing. <laughs> right, yeah, there's, there's a lot. So I think the things that I would want to talk about, um, Game Changer Plasma, what are your thoughts? Really cool. Uh, the We used a the Plasma rack on the Roofman record for snare drum, actually, oh, okay. which is cool. To, Interesting. Yeah, the, the producer basically split a parallel line out through the plasma to get some like extra bite on the snare and it was cool i like it man i think it's cool i some people think it's a gimmick because of the you know the lightning bolt the thor's hammer kind of vibe happening in the pedal i think it's rad and i think they sound super cool so i'm a fan yeah i'm not like the game changer stuff it, all the ones i've played it never like they sound cool but they don't they don't feel right under my hands uh i mean on a using it for like a snare drum or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but for me, like how I like play guitar and approach pedals, like there's, there's gotta be like a connection. Right. And I've never felt that with anything I've played of theirs, but you know, that, 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 that's kind of true for a lot of things for me. Um, so, you know, different strokes for different folks. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> Man, let's see what else. Phase 90. Is it the Juliana or the Julia? It says Walrus Audio Julia on here, which Julia, is a okay. great pedal. Yeah, my assistant just bought the Juliana last week, and it's very, very cool. Mm-hmm. Um, the Atreides, too. Man, I've, I've been wanting to, to check one of those out since they came out. That's, that's one that's been on my radar that I might need to try and pick up. Yeah, they are wacky, wacky, wacky. Wacky, uh, wacky. Um, could, all right, amps. So this is a Friedman modded by Friedman. What's the mod exactly? It says modded by Dave Friedman to run three channels with the JBE. Is that the brown eye voice switch as channel three, which I can use as clean, dirty rhythm or a lead boosted for solos. Dude, so really, really versatile setup there with the amplifier. And <clears throat> as we've talked about before. Oh, it's modded to have three channels instead of two, basically. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, this is helpful having him in the chat here. Yes. So as a, as we've talked about on this podcast before, the and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in uh, today's subject, but um, your amplifier, having a good amplifier is really, really important. It can make or break a rig, essentially. And depending oh, yeah. on what type of setup you've got, what, what you're going for, what your use case is, it seems to me like this is a very... Uh, it's a, a good marriage between tone, output wattage, the type of sounds that he's going for, but also having the three channels and, and pretty versatile. You can cover a lot of ground, do a lot of different sounds with this. I'm a fan. You know, even if this wouldn't necessarily be the type of amp that I would go for, I like the practicality of it. I think the modded 
the mod of being having uh, three channels instead of two is super useful. I'm a fan. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, like I, I've played a lot of the Friedman stuff, and some of it definitely isn't for me. But I've never played one and thought, oh, that sounded bad. You know? No. Yeah. 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 The, the, same here. I've never played a Friedman and been like, oh, this sucks. It's just some of it's not. I'm just not the super high gain player sounds that, that Dave tends to go for with his amps. Yeah. Yeah. But that I'm sure like that with an SG, uh, I just, I mean, it's yeah, a rock you, and roll. It just makes you want to play like what he describes. This right? is one of those rigs that I can hear it yeah. just by looking at it. Absolutely. I know exactly what that rig sounds like. Yes. And yeah. It sounds that, good. Yeah. It sounds, it just sounds like, uh, thunder. <laughs> it sounds like, uh, you would play in a band called Hellbot. Yeah. Which he does. Um, well, yeah. I mean, like, I don't know how far we need to go down through, because I, I think there's a lot here. Yeah. So I think for me, w- like, what what would you take away from this? Because that's where, that that's <clears> a, <throat> when I see this, I'm like, I don't need all that. But, yeah, but there's, that's a lot, just me. there's a lot happening here. There's, and and I, I'm looking at the board and it's hard to see. I, I think there are some, there is some redundancy there, but I'm not mm-hmm. sure. <sighs> Everything's a little different. The Thunderclaw, which yeah. is a different thing than the Southland and the and the, the Solo Dallas Schaefer replica thing. Like they all do a different job, but um, you know, again, it's just like if you're trying to cover a lot of tunes, you cover a lot of ground sonically. You may need here's, all that. Here's what I would do. Okay, I wouldn't take anything away from that board, but I would clean it up. I yeah. you could with the right wiring job and and a tiered pedal board, you could cut the size of that board in half. Um, yeah. and, and that's going to make, I can see the road case behind it too. And I I've had pedal boards that are that big before with cases and I know they suck. They're just tough, man. Loading in and out, putting it in and out of your car and the, the trailer and everything. I would make a conscious effort to get into a smaller, more compact pedal board. Because the thing is with that ES eight switcher, you don't need access to all those pedals. I, I highly doubt yeah. that he's tweaking um, settings on all those pedals all the time. So the stuff that stays the same, it can go under the tier of a tier pedal board. The stuff that you need access to can go on top. Um, yeah, I like the vertex board for this. Um, Mason, I think has done a good job of, of these like tiered pedal boards in different sizes. And there's like shapes cutouts for volume pedals and stuff. Mm-hmm. So that'd be the only thing I would change. Guitars are great. Amp rig yeah. is great. Props for a full stack. Like, hell yeah. yeah. Yeah, he says the board is 36 by 18 inches. So that's a, that's a big, <laughs> Dude, that's a big I bet board. it's heavy too. Yeah, but it's not going to um, get any lighter is the thing by, right. by doing that. It's just going to get easier to handle. Yeah, I mean, that is like, that is the, the point. Because like a, a an AC30 is heavy, but it's also awkward. <laughs> right. Oh, he just so, posted a closer up picture of the chat. Oh my God. Oh man. Bro, yeah. It, yeah. it stresses me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You need to, This is this is at the point now where it's like, you're probably going to have some, re- if you haven't already, you're going to have some reliability issues with that rig. And the, the pain is that if you do have a pedal go down or something happen, it's a little easier to diagnose with the switcher. But uh, with that rat's nest of cables there, first of all, you probably have a lot of noise in that rig because you've got power running right all over and intertwined with signal cable. I bet that rig's noisy as hell. And it's just, it's going to be hard to diagnose and fix when, when pedal, when cables go down. Yeah. I, like he says, it's surprisingly not that noisy. I don't know if all that is like as written in stone as some people make it seem like I know it, everything matters. Sure. But it's such low voltage and I don't know. Like, it's yeah, cable shielded. But, but the I, thing is, it is, it is more susceptible to RF interference with that. It can be with, yeah, it just, but I, a lot I would of that clean is the board power out. supply to like almost like. Uh, as as fundamental as as anything but um it's, it's, this is not the biggest board that i have ever i've had a board that was bigger than this which is I, ridiculous yeah. i think this um, is the biggest board i ever had in fact i think it was this exact size with what do you say 36 by 18 it was close yeah. to that yeah yeah well mine was the pedal i had the pedal train pro yeah which, i did which, too and 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 then I had pedals on the floor around it. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Why? <laughs> Why? Well, uh, we wanted to be the Mars Volta. It was a, it was oh, a, like a time. It. Okay. I but see. yeah, so what, what would you rate this thing? All right. Overall, I mean, I'm just being nitpicky, like cleaning up the board, I, I'm going to have to deduct some points for that. 
Okay. Mm. But the reality is it's I think it's less than a point. I'm gonna give this uh I'm gonna give this nine point two shoils. Oh man. This is a great it's, rig. That's a it's a great rig. I that's a little higher than I expected. Yeah. Um I just I, because I, this this rig is loud and, and fuzzy and I like that. So Hey. I mean it, it's rock and roll. Uh I I, w- I was gonna give it an eight eight point seven five. Yeah, we're I think, pretty close there. Yeah, I, like ditch ditch a few. Like, I mean, if it were me, I'd ditch some of the overdrives, just rely on my amp and my guitar, and uh, and clean up that wiring, and you'd be yeah set set. There we go. Well, on to today's topic. So uh, here's the deal. There's been a lot of people coming into uh, into guitar in the last two years since the pandemic happened. And we've touched yep. on this subject before, but I don't know that we've actually spent a whole episode on this subject specifically. So the reality is most of the people that listen to and watch this show are not first time guitar buyers. So yeah, here's, here's the deal. If you've gotten this far into the episode, uh, leave a comment with your own advice and your own input for someone who is watching this we're listening to this podcast who might be a first time or a new guitar buyer, because what we're talking about today is buying your first guitar. So you want to buy your first guitar. Now this can be, Hey, I've been playing acoustic for years and I want to buy my first electric or vice versa, or maybe you're completely new and you somehow found this podcast episode. And then you've somehow made it 28 minutes into this podcast episode of us talking about a bunch of nerdy, stuff (laughs) and you're still here and you're like hey i want to learn how to buy my first guitar that's what we're going to talk about today so yes zach what was your first guitar my first guitar was a pv raptor which was uh, like a strat (laughs) copy yeah (laughs) mine was a strat copy as well mine was a starcaster by squire it wasn't even a squire that's not a copy that's like a licensed thing right (laughs) well but it was a strat but it, but it, so it's weird because the, the Starcaster is an actual, it's a different model. shape, a different model. Yeah. But at some point in the early 2000s, Squire, I think, was licensing. I don't even think it was built by Squire. I think they were licensing it to some other builder to build they, the name. It had the triangle headstock, you know. Yeah, they, uh, the, well, there were some that had that pointy headstock and then some had like the big, like Strat headstock. Yeah. Like, uh, and I remember first seeing them at like Sam's Club and yeah, stuff. Yeah, they were they were like a Costco Sam's Club. My dad yeah. got it for me at Restoration Hardware of all places. <laughs> Before, dude, back in the early 2000s, Restoration Hardware, now it's like a, a really hoity-toity furniture store, right? For super yeah. rich people and Buckhead. But before, it, their old brand was like kind of vintage inspired, just stuff for the home. And you could go in there. I used to love going in there. It was Restoration Hardware at the Mall of Georgia because they had all kinds of like vintage and retro toys from the 50s and 60s, Neat. which was cool. And then, yeah, he was in there on Christmas Eve and just found this like Strat copy and picked it up. That's so funny. I know, like right? when I think if I thought Restoration Hardware would have that today, oh, they God, would have no. that and it would cost like way more than a Mexican standard Strat would. Oh, they would never even have, they wouldn't have a, any kind of instrument because it wouldn't fit their like Right. Aesthetic. There's no leather on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but not long after that, I started learning about like learning how to shop for and what kind of guitar is right for me. And it, it took a while. I remember this was before YouTube. This would have been, you know, 2004 and, you know, not long after getting my guitar, wanting another guitar. And so then it was like looking through musicians, friend catalogs or yeah. going to like Gibson's website and like looking at all the, I thought for a long time I wanted, this is so dumb. Do you remember the Bob Marley Les Paul <laughs> yeah, special? Yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted that real bad. I thought it was so cool. Yeah, I, I remember I had a Les Paul special that was very similar to that, that I won in a contest <laughs> uh, of all things. But yeah, I mean, and that was, I think that was kind of the era for all of us was the musician's friend. We all had the catalog yep. and we'd put it in our book at school and yep. like be circling it. And and I knew I knew from a very early age because I wanted to play guitar way before I ever got one. And it was something that I kept asking my parents about. And then I'd kind of, I'd forget, they'd forget. And then, you know, eventually when I was 15, I, I convinced them to get me one. But, um, I, I knew I always, I had always wanted a Strat 
Yeah. Like it just like, it looked right. But that was like all I knew, you know, I didn't. And, and then when you got Musician's Friend and you saw how much um, Gibson's cost and all that, it kind of, I know for me, it made me feel like, oh, this is, this has to be what I get because all that is so beyond mm. what I'll ever be able to afford. I mean, like that's when your 14, your 14 year old brain is thinking like, I'll never afford a Gibson, like thousands of dollars. Like what? Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I think one of the, one of the things we saw, this is Squire's 40th anniversary. And so that, that was part of the, you know, the idea like, wow, you know, they've been around that long. Like what, what are the best choices these days and how do people start? Shop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's more options than ever now to shop and having the uh-huh. internet and having YouTube and it's so much easier now, I think, to, to find a good guitar than it was back in our day, you know, back in the day. When you had yeah. To, you had to, Go to we pawn had to shops. Walk, dude, we had to walk to Guitar Center. Can you believe that? <laughs> Both ways. Okay. <laughs> these, these Gen oh Z kids God. don't know what it's like. They don't know the struggle. Right, you had to go find an associate and like walk walk over there and point something up on the wall and be like, "Hey, man, can I play that?" Yeah, I had, an, had I had inventory. a guitar. Yeah, I had a guitar center employee tell me one time that I was playing "Stairway to Heaven" wrong. <laughs> it was awesome. It was so cool. I was like this nervous kid wanting to try out a guitar, and I just like was trying to play "Stairway to Heaven." He's like, "Yeah, that's wrong. It's not how Paige played it." I was like, "Cool, man. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> God, it was yeah. great." Ugh. Ugh. Uh, so okay, so. One practical piece of advice I have for beginners, especially just buy what looks cool. If you, if you like the color, you like the shape, don't worry about, you know, all the stuff that we're worried about that take pickups and weight and what finish does it have? It doesn't matter. Buy what looks cool. If you want the hello kitty strap, because you think it looks awesome. And every single time you walk by it, you're like, Oh, I want to pick that guitar up and play it. Then that's the perfect guitar for you. That is absolutely the right guitar for you. The the Dan Electro that I have, the orange sparkle thing, I like the way that guitar looks, and I pick it up and play it because I like the way it looks even now. So yeah. don't don't worry too much about the minutia of you know guitar tone and setup. Even for people that have been playing for years, just if you like the way it looks and it makes you happy every time you walk in the room and you see it on the stand, you pick it up and play it, that's worth so much more than a more expensive, better sounding guitar that you just don't get on with, that you just don't, it doesn't excite you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's such a huge part of it because all of this, like, I, you know, you want to look down and and see your guitar and feel a connection to it. And sometimes, especially in the beginning, it's all going to be like this emotional, you know, it's not, there's not necessarily that, that physical connection yet because you don't know what you're doing, Yeah. but you want to feel compelled to play it and get excited about it. And if it's goofy looking or something that just makes you go, that's lame. Yeah. You're, you're never going to want to touch it. Yeah. And you know what, for, for el- the other thing that's happened during the pandemic, that's been really interesting is older people that have are beginner guitar players that have, you know, they've always wanted to learn how to play guitar, but now they, you know, they have time. They're working from home. They, and it yep. makes sense. And so I was talking to my friend Ben at Righteous. They have sold more three, four, and five thousand dollar guitars to complete beginners in the last two years than they ever had. And you know what? That's totally fair. Like yeah. if if your budget allows for that, and and you walk into a guitar store and you're like, oh, I like that one, and it's a you know Wood Library PRS Custom Twenty Four <laughs> that's eight thousand dollars. Okay. Mm buy that guitar if that's a guitar that's going to make you excited to go play it then by all means buy it um yep so that's one thing the other thing is uh let me think about how to prioritize this if you're buying an electric guitar Mm -hmm. take your budget and split it in half and half of that budget should go to the amp Right. The thing is the, if you have a, if you have five, let's say $800 to spend. Yeah. And you buy a $600 guitar and a $200 amp, that rig's going to sound like not great. I, mm, I don't know, man. Like I I don't think, I think a $400 guitar and a $400 amp is going to sound way better than an 800 or a 600, $200 guitar. well, I mean, I don't know. The, the, yeah, this is where this is where we're going to disagree a little bit. I feel like 
some of the entry level amps these days, um, I I would almost rather if I'm going to practice and learn, I would rather have a Keeley Katana than a Boss or a Fender Blues Junior, um, for me. And Keeley you know, Katana, not Keeley. Sorry, Boss Katana. <laughs> it's like I got this have a boost here. pedal than. <laughs> I wonder okay. how they got away with that because Keeley had the katana way before Boss did. Oh yeah, how did um, they get away with that? I don't know. Interesting. Maybe they're paying but anyway, them. Maybe they licensed it. Um, yeah. The, how much is the cheapest? Not not the mini one, which is the, I will the, admit, your battery really powered good. one that we played your clon through. Yeah, last time. and it sounded good. <laughs> uh, I don't so think it sounded good. It sounded interesting. <laughs> the Boss Katana Fifty Mark Two, uh, fifty watt combo, um, two hundred sixty nine dollars. Okay, so that fits. So if you have a five hundred dollar budget, that's two hundred fifty dollar guitar, roughly two hundred and fifty dollar amp. Mm -hmm. All right, but so I think that amp would serve as a beginner for longer. It would be more appropriate for learning. It, it if they want to go play with their friends, eventually it can do that, and would be better than having them dive into something tube that's going to be loud. It's probably not going to sound as good like i think that is a much better way to start on this journey Ooh, that's bold bold statement there i, I, think, I would rather play a boss katana than a blues junior you know day. and also the new line six um oh yeah, the catalyst how much catalyst yeah 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 i don't know let's look they're cheap yeah so uh, you're right i mean ba it, th there's a big difference now than there was uh yeah compared to when we started because when yeah. we started it was like a fender front man yeah, which sounded no, like yeah. ass. You get, you get a PV backstage or a Fender frontman or something like that, and that's it. That's all there was. Yeah, now there's a lot of options, or even a, a pedal or something like that, you know? Yeah. Um, but I still think it stands to reason that a good portion, my my thought is 50-50, the amp matters. And that's something oh, I yeah. think that's lost on a lot of beginners, where you get so excited about the guitar and the you know buying the best guitar you can get, and then... For beginners, sometimes the amplifier is an afterthought. Like, oh yeah, just whatever amp. But but, but no, <laughs> the yeah. amp matters a ton. Um, and I would even say for see, I, I I think about this differently. I say buy a better amp that you can grow into with other guitars. Because inevitably, what what ends up happening with beginners is you buy a guitar. The people that get interested and they stick with it, they end up two months, six months, eight months down the road, getting another guitar and then another guitar. It doesn't take long for people to start like accumulating guitars and, and buying stuff off. So to me, buying a better amp that's going to work with a wider range of your guitars and, and going to last you and help you grow into it. Even if it is something like a blues junior or some kind of tube amp that you can get into gigging with, I think that's the move. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I mean, I'm just the opposite because I feel like for it's going to be, I mean, I, I played my first gig probably before I'd been playing guitar a year. Same. Um, but I mean, gig, I, I played in front of other humans. <laughs> right. That's what I'm saying. I uh, like a performance. Yeah. 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 But um, I just, I feel like the options today uh, w with a modicum of research, you, you can have a great guitar sound for hardly any money for a long time. And, and, and as we've talked about, like there's ways to play on a computer or an iPad or something that yeah. I mean, arguably sound probably better than any amp under and $500. You know what? That is a, that is an important consideration to make. I mean, the, the reality is most, especially young people, um, like people are playing on their laptops, man. They're, they're yeah. plugging in, they're buying an interface. And that's an important thing to make. Like if you're getting into guitar because you want to write songs or you want to, maybe you're already a producer, a songwriter, and you're trying to learn how to play songs, then yeah, getting a amp plugin uh, that allows you to plug into your guitar or even using the stock sounds in a, in a DAW, like Logic, for example. Like yeah. Logic, you can get some cool guitar sounds out of Logic amps. Like, or GarageBand. Yeah, or even GarageBand. I mean, it just... Yeah. You just have to have a way to get the guitar into the the computer. So, I mean, yeah. But if you're going the traditional route, guitar and amp, I, I do think it's important to spend a good portion of your budget on the amplifier. I think it matters that much. Yeah, I, I don't think it, it it is unimportant. I just think there are so many more options that you can you can you can cheapen your budget on that end and get a, a better result than I mean 
I don't know, when did the katanas come out? I feel like the katana, I mean, the line stick spiders, I mean, everyone jokes about the spider, but they're like, they, they can sound really good, you know, and, and line six is yeah, not just but a slouch, I think, but I think line six was smart to kill off the spider because it's well, it but... such a negative and that's essentially what the catalyst is. It's like the, the newer version. Now right. if they'd get mad if, if they heard me say that, I mean, from my understanding, it's replacing the spider, the catalyst series is replacing the spider. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a good, because I think the spider brand became kind of such a, joke by the end that no one would take it seriously and they couldn't compete with like the katana for example right if they sounded the same you know yeah because i feel like even like up until the katana nothing really stuck with a lot of people because you had the spider you had the fender mustang series you had uh pv make it the viper or whatever they had you know like all those weird things and like once the katana hit, I think everyone realized, oh, if you really put your mind to it, you can make a lot of, you can get some great guitar sounds for a reasonable um, amount of money. But thinking of guitars, where, if, if, if someone came to you and asked, where do I start? And they, they didn't necessarily know, like they wanted to say, you know, I, I play, I really love indie rock or blues or whatever. Like what would be the brand that you would say, oh, start here? Uh, Squire. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt. I think, well, it depends on the budget, right? So let's maybe clarify that. Let's say, you know, I have... I feel like most guitar players start with like a, five, you know, sub $500 guitar. Yes, definitely sub five. I think closer to three. Yeah. So in that price range, I'm I'm Squire all day. I mean, the, the Epiphone stuff, the new Epiphone stuff is really good. I mean, my, I love yeah. my casino, that Chinese casino, but it, it was more expensive. That was 700 um, Just because of the construction of those guitars, they are just going to be more money. Um, and a lot of the Squire stuff, especially the Affinity series we've talked about a lot, like you can get a lot of bang for your buck and jump on Reverb or your Facebook Marketplace or something and uh, because there's a lot of people that, you know, bought those guitars and are looking to get out of them to upgrade or to mm-hmm. get into something else, or maybe they just never played it and they're getting rid of it. Like you don't have to go to a retailer and buy a brand new guitar. Now there are pros to that. And if you're a beginner, you may not know that guitars are susceptible to seasons changing. And um, this brings up another good point, whatever guitar you get, I think it's a, a really good idea to have the guitar set up by a professional before you start learning it. Yeah. Meaning you have the action or the string height off of the fretboard adjusted. Um, and you have the intonation set up. You get it so where it, say, it stays in tune really well when you play it. If it's easy and comfortable to play, then you're going to end up uh, playing it more. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just getting the fret ends like filed or, or smoothed out can make it can make the cheapest guitar feel like a guitar five times ten times the price you know just having it taking it to attack and say hey round off these fingerboard or this fretboard ends and maybe roll the fingerboard i used to do it myself with the edge of a like a screwdriver Mm. and just go in between the frets and go which was probably a bad thing but you know if they're real sharp it will round it out (laughs) yeah and that that makes it more comfortable play i mean that's that that happens naturally with old guitars you know the more they're played the more the the fingerboard edges roll in so that's a big thing whatever guitar you get make sure it's set up get it get good strings on it get good get the pickup height dialed in get the intonation right the action right um that is going to do huge huge things for you as a beginner helping you Mm. learn Uh, it's gonna help you learn faster you're gonna get less hand fatigue it's it's the move yeah now when in discussing squire uh because i'm on sweetwater Mm -hmm. and i I sorted low to high and um i actually don't know if i've seen this i've seen the the affinities but in the price range like sub classic vibe because really like i don't even know like the Squire series, do they still have like the standard or like they used to have the vintage modified right. series? But anyway, there's so many brands now that are like that, like Ibanez, like, uh, like uh, uh, Kramer has a well, bunch of that sort of thing. Did you yeah. see Paul David's video recently on this where he bought a bunch of like, oh. I think it was 200 euros or something. 
And uh, I think the Ibanez did not fare very well in his comparison. In fact, I think the Ibanez was like pretty, pretty bad. I haven't, I haven't watched that. I saw it and like most things I see something go, oh, that's cool. I'll watch that and then I'll walk away <laughs> in my mind. Um, but I mean, are there any competitors? Because to me, I feel like it's, is it a cop out to say, oh, just get a Fender, just get a Squire. I mean, there's, um, there's, you know, Harley Benton. There's, um, yeah, let's see here. Yes, there are competitors yamaha i mean especially on the acoustic front we've we've spent most of our time talking about electrics but on the acoustic front yamaha is killing it with the beginner and entry level acoustic market they always Uh, have they always have and and yeah i mean i did an acoustic guitar shootout video a couple years ago and didn't include yamaha and i should have that was like stupid of me and oversight but um yeah i mean in my mind that three to five hundred dollar beginner guitar, somebody that's wanting to play rock, blues, country, indie rock, like Squire. Yeah. And there's such a wide range of guitars that they make in that space. That's just where I'm at still. They they really do. They have the the Affinity series. And I mean, they have the Starcaster, like the actual Starcaster guitar, right. the hollow body thing. Telly's Jazz Masters now, which is like crazy. Um and then when you get into like the four hundred dollar range, that's when you're stepping into like classic vibe and up and and like those guitars, you know, honestly, they're with a good setup and and maybe eventually a swap of pickups or pots, that that guitar could last you your entire life and do everything you'd ever need it to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, for the most part. Yeah, man. So. But that I mean I feel like that's so lame because like Yamaha has the Pacifica, which are killer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, there's these, uh, those Sire guitars. I don't know how much those are. The Larry Carlton things. Yeah. Have you seen those? They do a bass too, the, right? The, the bass was like where it all started. With the Marcus but... Miller. I didn't know they were doing guitars now. Is it Marcus mm-hmm. Miller that? I believe so. The yeah. Discord will correct us. Um, someone said, uh, uh, whoop de doo in the chat said, I'm so curious about Revstars. Still never tried one. Revstars are awesome. Incredible yeah. guitars. Um, so, I mean, really, it feels like, I mean, that's a shame to hear that the Ibanez was a, a stinker, but, you know, well, that it could was, have just that been that guitar. One, yeah, it was one, one case. But I think, again, going back to it, there's so many options. If you're a beginner, just get what you like the look of. Yeah. It's in your budget and you like the way it looks because that is the most important thing as a beginner is spending as much time playing as possible. So getting a setup that's going to encourage you to play and make it easy to play meaning you don't have like don't leave your stuff put away like don't leave the guitar in its case and the amp in a closet and like leave the stuff out and plugged in so that all you have to do is sit down grab the guitar and start playing even now i mean i that's why i leave my stuff out all over the place it makes a mess but i can sit down and whatever i want to do i can just flip the thing on and start playing yeah, totally. I, I, uh, it's always a bummer for me in the winter cause I try to put everything up and like humidify and store it because like, I, I just don't keep my guitars out and I'll want to keep them out to look at them and play them. Even if I'm just like sitting on the couch, but I, I don't, but yeah, I think in the beginning you have to keep that in the back of your mind or it, it just, it'll go away. It did for me. There, there was like months when I started learning that I just got bored with it and it lived in a case under my bed. Mm. Um, but like where, in addition to all this, cause I think, you know, most beginner guitars are great. Most beginner amps are great. Don't, I would say, do not bother with pedals at first. Um, yeah. You're, you're going to get in over your head. I, yeah. I think it's just cause there's so much out there. There's so much to learn and so much to do. Take your time to learn the fundamentals of your instrument. I think first. Yeah. But how do you think the, where do you think the best place is to go learn? You think it's still the classic, like find a teacher locally? I think that can be a good option for a lot of people, but given the pandemic and situations, I think that's uh, instead of necessarily in person, I think zoom lessons are a good idea. Yeah. Um, the advantage of getting an, a one-on-one lesson is you're getting a curated teaching experience with someone that knows you and knows where you're at and can help a good teacher can help craft a lesson. It's like having a trainer and working out. Yeah. You can go to the gym by yourself and like figure it out, or you can have a trainer and have someone there to like, you know, help you meet your goals. Oh yeah. Um, 
with that said, though, that is cost prohibitive for many people out there. And uh, you don't have to learn guitar that way. I, I was self-taught for six years before I ever had a teacher. Yeah. Um, so and now with things like YouTube, with with my channel and with the other guitar channels out there, I mean, there's so many resources to learn about playing and, and lessons. The thing that you have to be careful of is it's really easy because of the YouTube algorithm to start f- going down these wormholes and learning things in like kind of out of order uh so you kind of start to put together this like patchwork knowledge of things without knowing how they're necessarily connected specifically around like learning the guitar and the theory behind the fretboard and things like that so uh video courses can be a good way to do that shameless plug in fact um the second video course that i'm going to do this year is going to be a straight ahead beginner guitar course and it's going to be like 29 bucks it's going to be like an hour and a half two hours long maximum and it's going to be a hey cool you just got your first guitar here's how this works we're going to tune it here's the different parts of the guitar here's what pickups do here's your basic like a a 30 dollar course that's going to get you up and running and playing right um that's the idea with that so there's there's stuff there's resources out there like that now uh, even even like Fender Play, Fender has has invested um, tons of money into their Fender Play program. And yeah. don't be mistaken, that's not out of the goodness of their hearts. What they're trying to do there is get you to buy your first guitar as a Fender or a Squire, get you to learn from Fender, and essentially what they've done is bought a lifelong customer at that point, yeah. right? If you if you learned on a Fender through Fender, then you're going to be that much more likely to keep buying Fenders, you know. Yeah, Uh, which is not a bad model, you know. If only PV had done that for me. (laughs) Hey, man, look, if PV made a course, (laughs) I bought it. You know, I'd hop right in the back of that pickup truck. If if PV had a college, all the way, I'd have went. Man, ride it all the way to the Skinner show. Goddamn right. Listen, front row. (laughs) I didn't do that good in uh, traditional book learning, but if uh, if PV would have had a high school. Shit, man. <laughs> Hartley PV University. <laughs> HPU. HPU. Dude, we need... Oh, oh my man. God. That should be a t-shirt. There is a t-shirt. Yeah, well, I'm going to write that down. Hell um, yeah. Well, to ra- I guess to we're kind of getting to the end here. Uh, how, did, how did you learn? Like, when you started, how, how were you self... Because my favorite Mitch Hedberg joke, I tried to teach myself how to play guitar, but I didn't know how to play guitar, so I was a terrible teacher. Like, how did you learn <laughs> uh, that to play guitar? That is true. I, I got my guitar, and I was so excited about it that I would just sit and, like, play randomness on it. And then uh-huh. it literally... I had my radio going. I used to have an Iowa stereo system in my room like a little boom box and it was on uh it was when 96 rock was still a thing here in atlanta and i was listening 96 rock was on the radio and literally smoke on the water came on and i just i heard heard it and went Duh, on the the low e, the low e string i was like oh that's that note and then kind of figured it out and it was just one it wasn't the right part necessarily right. but it was enough for me that i thought i was playing the song and was like, oh my god, I just figured this out. And it, at that point, something clicked, and I was like, dude, this is this is it. You start listening. So, I started by listening to stuff. Um, I had some friends in the church that I grew up in that were playing guitar, and a friend across the street that taught me some chords and like taught me some of the basic stuff, the pentatonic scale, that kind of stuff. And then I just started looking up guitar tabs and listening to records and trying to play what I was hearing, and not very successfully, but. What I didn't realize at the time is I was training my ear and um, I was transcribing stuff. And I pretty quickly uh, learned that like the tabs on ultimateguitar.com, most of them were just wrong because I oh, could yeah. figure out like, oh, this is telling me to play here, but I, my ear is telling me that's wrong. I should probably trust what I'm hearing. Um, and that was it, man. I did that every single day for six years. And yeah, that's how I man. learned it. I, uh, I, I, my parents got me like a videotape thing. I'm sure I saw like an infomercial and like, you know, play guitar fast or something. And I started with that. And then, um, I got, I got a bunch of guitar mags and started teaching myself how to read tab in like guitar world and stuff. Uh, the first tab I ever figured out how to like sight read was, uh, the trooper by Iron Maiden, which is, 
I mean, that's that's kind of a big ask, I guess, yeah, for right. a, a kid right. who's never played. But then I got a, um, oh man, um, it was a sh- like a um, like a, a VHS Hot Licks, the Metallica mm. Hot Licks VHS tape, and it came with like this tiny brochure that had tab that was like you basically needed like a magnifying glass to read it, and that's. One of the places I started, I mean, all the while, like I loved Eric Clapton and I loved like Stevie Ray Vaughan and all this stuff, but I like wanted to play like metal and punk rock and stuff. And so that's kind of how, how I cut my teeth. And then I got lessons like, like a year or so into it uh, from a guy who was just like on another planet. Mm. Um, but um, it, it was really, it was hard for me because of my hand, like really getting started because, you know, you'd see a bar chord and I right. couldn't do it. Yeah. I just, it was impossible uh, at the time. And even now I have to use my thumb like Jimi Hendrix sort of thing. But um, yeah, the, the, that, that hot licks tape, man, I wore it out mm. learning seek and destroy and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Cool, man. Well, there you go. You have a uh, shill of the week. Ready I think, go? I think we both have a, a, a shill that's, Oh yeah. New guitar day. New guitar day. So I've had this for a few weeks now. Yeah. And uh, my this is a let's see. A Swope. Swope. Geronimo. Uh Chris Swope, who I think works at like Defender Custom Shop and has done a bunch of things. This was the twenty I think it's a twenty sixteen <laughs> NAM show guitar nice. that he had at the summer NAM show, then brought it to Carter and there it sat. Um, and it's a, it was a damn shame because this thing is remarkable. And, um, the more I've played it, the more I've fallen in love with it. These pickups, he, I, I, cause we've spoken, I met him at the shop and like, we talked a bunch, uh, you know, in the, the years after we met and I said, what are these pickups? Cause they look, um, they look like P90s kind of. Yeah. They'd look like a P90 or a jazz master pickup, but they, uh, he said they're, they're basically a hybrid of a Strat and a Tele pickup. They have like oh. the three screws, but he says they lean more Tele than Strat. But this neck pickup sounds like the best Strat pickup you've ever heard. And this bridge pickup sounds like the fattest Tele pickup. And they have that character that a PAF has where when you dig into a note, it kind of blooms, mm. which I've never really heard a single coil do. Yeah, you know? right. And um, it's just... It's just great. It was gnarly from being in the shop and like just people touching it and it just got gross over the years, but I cleaned it up and it's, it's really good. It's not, it's not super heavy. It's pretty lightweight and, um, everything about it works. It has the heel, the like, uh, music man oh, little yeah. wheel where you stick the thing in and adjust the truss rut. Perfect. <laughs> uh, nice. And, um, yeah, Swope, man. Uh, he doesn't. He posts a lot of, like, he makes these guitars called the Biscayne, which are kind of like a Dan Electro. Right. Um, well, kind of, sort of thing. It's like the construction is similar to that. But they're, I think they're pretty cheap, but he doesn't, he's not been posting a lot of these guitars built, but, you know, like Ronnie Wood has one and, like, he's a legit dude and it's an amazing guitar. So really happy to have it. Beautiful. Well, this is also amazing guitar that I am really happy to have. This is my 1965 Gibson SG Jr. Um, I believe I am the third owner of this guitar, fourth owner. Um, so this came from a shop in Atlanta called Maple Street Guitars, and actually wasn't the shop's guitar. One of the it, Maple Street's owned by family, and um, the son, one of the owners of the family, Lindsay, uh, who I've known for years and years, is. Uh, a very discerning guitar player. He's not quite a collector, but he, he has a lot of really, really nice pieces. And this was one of them. And they at the shop got in a 1943 D 28. Um, that is a Canon. And, uh, Lindsay is more of a finger style guitar player or acoustic player. Sorry. And, um, so he decided that it's time to start parting with pieces of his collection. So we just, uh, Tilly and I went in there just on a whim on Saturday, this past Saturday, because it had been a while since I've been in. This is the shop that I bought my 64 AC30 from. Uh, and it's funny because they're not they're not known as like a vintage shop. They don't feature a lot of vintage gear. But if if you know, if you know to, who to talk to, they've got some cool stuff. Right. So I'd, I'd talk to Lindsay and said, 
hey man, yeah, you guys got anything cool in? I'm not necessarily looking for a guitar. I'm just, you know, what's up? What do you have in? He's like, actually, I've got something you might like. And he pulled this out. And I was like, oh boy. So, um, yep, never owned an SG. This is 5.8 pounds. It's uh, all original. Everything's there. No headstock break, no body break, original frets. Um, We checked the pots. The pot dates are right. The, uh, The pickup, we pulled the pickup. It's right. Um, do, do you know what the output on the pickup is? No, no, we did not measure the output. Yeah. But it is a. Uh, this is probably the most resonant guitar I own now. I mean, just even through the. And I have a gate on this mic right now, but. Dude, like. It's crazy. This it's is so a. Crazy. This is a ringer right here. I've got an open E right now because I was playing some slide on it. It's a. It's a ripping slide guitar. Yeah. And um, yeah, my first vintage guitar, and I feel really lucky to be able to uh, own it. And I guess the way you think about you know vintage guitars is it's like uh, you're, you're kind of just a steward for this thing at this point, right? You know? Well, uh, what what's the nut width? Is it still one eleven sixteen? Yeah, this is the wide nut, so okay. it's the yeah, it's the proper nut. And um, I guess uh, there's some confusion, at least from my perspective, on when Gibson was doing the wide nut versus the narrow nut. Oh, this is a man. 65, and it's got the wide nut, but I think they were also doing some narrow nut widths in 65 as well. Yeah. Uh, it depended on the model. Um, yeah, I mean, like, because the, there were some... Uh, 64s had started, but it, like I think mainly it was 65. But you know, it could it could depend on when that guitar was in production, uh, when it happened. And like you know, I, I've played I've played guitars of that era that w- they probably just didn't sand as much, and they're like one in ten sixteenths. You know, yeah, it's, right. Um, so it, it's, I mean, that's probably like an earlier one, so it was still one in eleven, right. and. You know, I, I much prefer that. I feel like when they're one and nine sixteenths, it, it feels like a broom. Uh, yeah, handle. I can't, I cannot play the narrow nuts. Yeah. I, I, I can't do it. Like, um, I, I just, I have a, a big hand and, uh, yeah, some people like them and if you can get away with them, it's great because you can get vintage guitars pretty reasonably priced because the narrow nut Gibsons are not nearly as valuable as the, as the wide, the wide yeah. ones are. I, ugh, I don't like them. <laughs> there have been a few that I, I kind of bonded with, but they were always like like wider than nine sixteenths. I played an old uh, Sheraton that had like the the mini hum, like I think like the New York New Yorker style pickups. The ones with a little plastic on the edge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's what they were. Uh, and that guitar was cool, and it was kind of narrow, but it was like it still was still had a vibe. It still worked. But some of them, like most most of the time, the SGs especially. Um, they just feel so small. It feels like just so foreign to me. Yeah, I agree. But this one's not. This is a. Uh, this one's proper. So, Man. Um, somebody in the chat's asking any plans to change the bridge. No. Um, this is this is going to stay stock as it as it is. So. Um, yeah, if the yeah. intonation's not a problem, the lightning bar bridge are fine. Um, the only yeah. the only thing that's like a worthy upgrade is like the. Um, Mojo Axe bridge, which is, it's compensated by literally like the form of the metal moves. Mm. So like the top of it, you can't, you can't even see it. It doesn't look like there's any change, but when you string it up, it's, it's dead on and yeah, but if it works, unless it's like going to break, there's no reason to change it. Yeah. I mean, it's an easy swap. I mean, you just take the tailpiece out and put a new one in, but um, for now I'm going to stick with it and uh, just enjoy it, man. Start playing it. Using it in videos, using it on uh, recordings and whatnot. Just have a you good gonna, time with it. You're going to gig with it? I might, actually. I mean, yeah. Why I, does it have a case? I mean, it can fit in a mono. It's, 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 got, the, it's got the neck breaker case. It's got the original case that I will not be traveling with because they are notorious for breaking necks and headstocks on these. Mm-hmm. Um, and I am a little, I mean, looking at the neck tenon, like there's not a lot of wood there, so be, you it, gotta be real careful with these it, SGs. It goes under the pit guard a little bit, but not much. <laughs> yeah, not a whole lot. So yes, don't drop it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> try Ooh. not to. Uh, oh man, what? Oh, I, I remember. So rewinding all the way back, my first nice guitar uh, was a Gibson Les Paul Special. Um, it was a 2001, and um, 
Fox News in Nashville was doing like a, you mail in a postcard and they will draw your name and you can win a guitar. And they pulled my sister's name, which like everyone sent it in for me. And, um, but they pulled my sister Hannah's name and, uh, my mom like text or called her or something at school. And she was like, we won. And so <laughs> won the guitar. And I had that. And like, not a few days later, I was in, like an idiot was in the bathroom with it on a strap. Like I was clothed and I had it on a strap looking at myself like, damn, I'm so cool. And then it went boom and just like <laughs> fell on the floor, hit, the, hit the, the counter and everything. It was fine, but I dropped that guitar so many times. Oh I don't know God. how I didn't break it. Never broke That's... it. Oh my God. <laughs> well, there you go, everyone. Dipped in tone. Thanks for hanging out. Yeah. Uh, join the Patreon if you want to support us. Yes. Catch and episode live. We are, uh, well, we've not talked about this, but I want to work on more merch. Um, the plan a while ago was for me to handle it. I don't think I, I don't have room to handle more shirts and stuff, but I want right. to rework the Teespring thing, um, get some more designs, get some more fun stuff on there. We do have that. And I think we should probably make a website yep. <laughs> for okay. all this stuff. Absolutely. So, Got to do that. Got to do it. About that time. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thanks for hanging out. We will catch y'all in the next one. Bye. Bye.